This video will go through band beams and line beams in the SLB software. Before we look at the program, we'll quickly review what we mean when we say line beam, what we mean when we say band beam. So a line beam is a conventional one-way beam with a depth typically bigger than its width and it exhibits predominantly one-way behavior. So it's designed according to section 8 of AS3600. A band beam, however, generally is wider than it is deep and it exhibits behavior of both a slab and a beam. Now this isn't clearly defined in AS3600 and we're not, we, we're not sure which section should we design it to, section 8 beam or section 9 slabs. Going to the SLB software, we'll have a look at band beams and line beams within the program um, with this very simple example. So how we draw them, what they are and what the various settings are and what they do. So let's switch off the visibility of the wide beam and the beams first. So we have a 180 thick slab and we have this thickened slab zone here of 600. So if we switch the beam back on, we're going to model essentially the same geometry uh, firstly as a one-way beam represented by this yellow element and then as a thickened slab zone. So the yellow element on the top here is the um, basically is the line beam element. So we, if we select it we see we have a width and a depth and we'll just delete it, we'll show how we draw it. So going to the home tab we hit beam, we draw it by clicking its two ends to define its length pressing F5 to mesh again. What happens when we draw this yellow beam element? We're just applying a line of stiffness to the slab. So this yellow rectangle we see on screen is purely visual for us. Uh, we're applying a line of stiffness to all of these fine and element nodes along um, basically the center line of the beam element. So if, for example, we were to change its width, it's just visual the line of stiffness is being applied to these finite element nodes. How we draw a band beam is we uh, create a thickened slab zone within the slab. So we've done the same thing, one meter wide beam defined with geometry lines and then we apply a different thickness to it. So obviously we would have to generate the mesh to create the different thickness. So that is how we actually draw the structure. At the moment the program doesn't know that this is to be a wide beam. It doesn't know that we should be, it doesn't know that it should be extracting results in this area um, and designing it as if it were a beam. How we do that, we have to draw a wide beam over the top of it. So we've got two different ways of drawing it. So this is defined with two points, which is the way that it was drawn now. So we'll draw it again, we'll delete the existing one define with two points and draw center to center. If we switch that off, we can then modify the width that um, we want to draw over the top of. Now, notice that when we drew the, uh, the wide beam, we didn't lose our mesh, we didn't lose our results. That is because the orange wide beam itself is not, a, is not part of the structure. It's simply a length and a width that we're going to integrate over. So again, we can draw this over any slab zone. We could draw it over the slab, the thickened areas, wherever we want to. This is just simply an, an area over which we're going to integrate and extract results. So that was defining with two points. And the other way is to define with three points. So how we do this, we sp the first click spe and the second click specifies the width and the third click the length. So in a similar way, we um, instead of defining it with two points, we have defined it with three. We've modeled the same size beam in two different ways, and as we'll see, it will produce two different sets of results. Now, that is because this is a one-way line beam, predominantly acting in the one direction, and this is a two-way plate with capacity and bending in both directions. So if we hit F6 to run the analysis, we'll have a look at the results. hit exit and we'll go straight away to the, the beam results. So we will go to results, beams, envelope design, hit the beam we want to look at. We can look at the results in this smaller table here or we can just hit report. So here we have a 
mid span bottom moment of about 260 kilonewtons per meter. The program also designs based on the shear, the number of legs for us, the top and bottom steel. But we'll just look at the bending moment here. So we'll remember this 260 and we'll hit OK and we'll go to wide beam envelope design. There's only one wide beam, so we hit OK. The program integrates over that length and width. And here we have a slightly larger bending moment of about 314. So basically two different ways of modeling, two different sets of results. Closing this, hitting escape. We'll have a look at the, the difference in the deflections as well for the two different methods. So we'll select load combination two long-term deflections. So this is 50% KCS, hit deflections. And we'll just click along the mid-span of these beam elements that we've drawn, or the band beam. So the line beam element has a, a lower deflection. The wide beam has a higher deflection. Basically, why this is happening, the line beam has a single moment of inertia. So basically, this beam can only bend in the one direction. Uh, and this is basically forming a T-section with the slab. The plate element, however, can bend in three. So we have bending in the X, bending in the Y, and twisting as well. So the plate element in this case, for this very simple case, a simply supported span of about eight meters, will be deflecting more. It may not be the best idea to always use the yellow beam element because it might not always be providing the best deflections but that will be shown in the next example. Next, we'll have a look at some of the settings in the model and solver settings that affect the beam results. So hitting escape to redraw. We'll go to input material properties and we see some beam properties here. So these beam properties refer to the yellow beam element. They also refer to the beam design in the wide beam tool. Other, other factors that influence the beam design is basically the beam shear. So we set the stirrup size effective cover. All of that is set here. And then finally, there's another one under service load settings. If we want to uh, model equivalent, if we want to model um, steel sections as equivalent concrete sections, we should switch on this use eye gross for beams. We won't show this in, in this video, but if we wanted to model steel beams cast into the slab or supporting the slab, we would model their equivalent concrete properties and then switch on the eye gross. So basically the section does not crack. The compressive reinforcement, basically unlike the, um, unlike the slab, it's not designing it directly. So we need to specify some value of steel that it puts into the compressive zone for deflection calculations. So currently set at 50%. Now there's another factor here which is called the beam stiffness factor. So what this is, is basically we specify some artificial stiffening of the beam. Now why this was introduced, uh, this was introduced because the uh, basically the bending moment taken by the beam and hence the reinforcement in the beam when looking at two-way plate elements, so find an element software in general, was producing much lower results, much lower reinforcement results than one-way beam, so than one-way beam theory. So the suggested factor of four, we'll switch this on, we'll hit OK, and we will run it again. The suggested factor of four will give this beam a um, basically bending moment and reinforcement results that will be comparable to one-way, if we were to design this as a simple one-way, simply supported span. So previous results were in the order of about 260. If we go back to results, beams, envelope design, hit the report and go up a bit further and go back to the report. This is now increased to about 280. So again, we, we're, we're artificially stiffening the beam but we did not see uh, we did not see a sort of an, a factor increase of four in the bending moment. Um, that is because the slab and the beam are working together, and the bending moment is split between the slab and the beam. So the difference in in the beam is not just four times greater. This the increase in the beam will be proportional to the ratio of the stiffness between the slab and the beam. So there's no 
there's no basically we're not going to be able to change that factor and then see some direct increase in the bending moment it will also be a function of the stiffness of the surrounding slab or the slab that the beam sits on but the purpose of that factor it's in the software so that we can artificially uh, basically make the beam stiffer so that we get more reinforcement into the beam now if we if we're putting more if we're putting more stiffness into the beam, there'll be more reinforcement in the beam itself. However, there will be less reinforcement in the surrounding slab. We hit OK, and we'll just, with that stiffness factor set to four, we'll have a look at the deflections. Going back to long-term deflections, we can see, again, the deflections are pretty much exactly the same as they were before. So the, um, the, the, the biggest stiffness factor means that there's a higher bending moment in the slab. So for deflection calculations, that means the service moment M star S will be bigger. Uh, the ultimate moment will also be bigger. So the, the amount of reinforcement designed in the beam is bigger. So the fact that the, um, the, the biggest service moment will create a lower I effective I effective value this is offset by the fact that there will be more reinforcement in the section and, um, and more reinforcement in the section obviously will be better for deflections so in this case it has balanced out now it's just for this particular example it might not occur in the wide beam as well when we perform a similar operation that increase in capacity caused by the increased steel and the decrease in capacity caused by the larger service moment balance each other out. So there's no change in deflections. So that is the beam stiffness factor as it applies to line beams. If we hit escape to redraw, we have a similar factor for the for the band beam elements. So it's not a factor of the orange wide beam that we see on screen. As we mentioned before, this is just an integration zone, so we don't associate any stiffness with it. This is just an area over which we extract results. If we want to artificially increase the stiffness of the, um, of the band beam element, we must have mesh. Then we must select the slab zone that is thicker, and then we can change the stiffness factor parameter here. So when looking at these wide beams, it should also be mentioned, if they're cast in situ concrete, they should always be kept as two-way. So despite this, um, this band beam having its predominant action in the X direction, for example, it still has some capacity in the Y. So we shouldn't set it to one way, unless it obviously is some sort of proprietary product that will only be spanning in the one direction. If we set it to one way, we'd, we would see a huge increase in deflections. So uh, cast in situ band beam should always be kept as two-way. Now we'll perform a similar operation that we did for the, um, the yellow beam element. We'll increase its stiffness factor by a factor of four. And we will run the analysis again. Have a look at the bending moment and the deflection. So we go to results, wide beam, envelope, hit number one. So we see some increase, so the, the, the bending moment has gone up from 314 to 360, and again, it won't increase by a factor of four. Uh, the, it's, it's going to be an increase that's sort of relative to the stiffness of the surrounding structure as well. So some increase, but not by a factor of four. So again, some artificial stiffening will cr produce more bending moment in the slab. or more, more bending moment in the wide beam. And looking at the deflections, go results, deflections case, yes. In this case, the deflections have gone up slightly. So the, the increase in the bending moment has created um, basically a larger service moment. Therefore, the value of I effective will be a bit lower. And in this case, this wasn't offset by the increase in the amount of steel that was needed. So we're seeing a slight increase in deflections in this particular area by doing this. Now, 
this was again just for this particular example other examples may be um, may be different so in summary what we learned from this simple example the yellow elements align beams one way the wide beams are drawn with a basically they're drawn with geometry lines to define an area of different thickness then the wide beam the orange wide beam is drawn over the top of it in order to extract the results if we want to artificially stiffen up the various elements the various beam elements be they a line beam or a wide beam uh, so that they take more moment have more reinforcement in them uh, for the line beam we go to input material properties beam beam stiffness factor and we modify this and for the band beam wide beam we select the slab zone and modify the stiffness factor here now the next few examples we will go through a few other things that we need to consider when modeling um, beams and when choosing between band beams and line beams so this example will show what happens when we use line beams instead of using the band beam now we have uh, uh, slab predominantly spanning its primary direction is in the YY 200 thick and we have some band beams that have been modeled as line beams so a width of 2.5 meters depth of 0.45 if we run the analysis we'll see what deflections this is giving us so by the very fact that we've modeled them as line beams the um, we're just putting a line of stiffness at the center line, so at the center line of these columns. So we're effectively making this span uh, two and a half meters uh, in total longer. So if we look, if we go to load combination, long-term deflections with 50% KCS uh, steel, and then we go to deflections, we see a very large value here of about 50 millimeters, so way too big. Now we're going to change these to band beams or thick and slab zones and we'll see what effect this has on the deflections so rather than um, hitting escape to redraw rather than manually drawing the geometry lines we'll just use the um, the beams that we've drawn so with one of them selected we go to the edit tab and we see the context menu comes up specifically for the beam so we'll choose to convert all beams to geometry lines hit OK and we see geometry lines have replaced our beam elements pressing F5 to remesh we now just have to go ahead and start inputting our slab thickness with the thickness input we'll rerun the analysis so now the span of the slab is 2.5 meters less uh, this basically it's essentially it's a band beam but it will have significant capacity in the y direction as well so it will be helping with deflections in the y and we'll see what effect this has had on our results so we see that 50 mil has dropped down to about 13 so this span is now working so this is uh, basically one consequence of using um, basically correctly using band beams when we should and the other thing we saw was how to convert the beam elements into geometry lines so it, w it might be a bit tedious sort of drawing these geometry lines adjusting their widths but it's a bit quicker to draw a beam element select it and then convert it to a geometry line and we'll look at one final example when should we be using wide beams when are wide beams too wide when should we be detailing it as a slab and select this really wide one so width of 8 meters we go to results wide beam envelope design basically the program will still perform its integration over this, over this width it sees that it's um, it's got a length and a width and it will integrate over it it will design and detail it, it detail it as if it were a beam however it's up to the user to decide if we can reasonably design this length and width as a beam element um, you know should we be designing it to the uh, basically as a slab 
should we be detailing it in a slightly different manner? So it still produces the results over the width and length that we've um, that we've uh, that we've specified. However, we it might not be suitable for us to design and detail this as if it were a beam, um, especially for things like shear. Now there are other ways to have a look at shear results for this particular section. So we may want to look at it um, for basically for punching shear. So we have 450 thick slab that's covered in the punching shear video, or we may want to look at the shear results using thick plate theory. So again, that will be covered in the shear video. So a brief brief overview of what we learned. There's there's two ways of defining beams in the um, in the inductor software. There's the yellow line beam element. So this is typically a one-way element uh, with all of its capacity in the one direction. This is a line of stiffness that gets applied to the finite element nodes along the beam center line. And the, this yellow rectangle we see on screen is simply a visual representation. Uh, so this should be used for conven conventional beams that are typically deeper than they are wide uh, and that are going to be designed in detail to section 8. So band beams, so beams that are wider than they are deep, should be modeled as a thickened slab zone. So generate the mesh and then assign a different slab thickness. We must have a geometry line to define this area of different thickness, of course. Then we draw the, uh, the orange wide beam over the top of it to extract the results. So that is if we want to design and detail the wide beam as a beam to section 8. Uh, if we're going to be performing additional checks in the wide beam, such as punching shear checks, basically that is covered in a different video. The punching shear video will also uh, assist in determining whether a wide beam should be treated as a conventional one-way beam or as a two-way slab. Yes, so this concludes this video. Thank you for watching.